Good morning. If I could ask people to take their seats. Uh, my name is Nizar Jarjour. I am the division head for the allergy, pulmonary, and critical care medicine. And on behalf of Dr. Page, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this special edition of our Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. It is the William Bussey Annual Visiting Professor of Medicine Lecture. Let me say a few words about Dr. Bussey first, and then we will introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Bill went to medical school here at the University of Wisconsin after finishing undergrad at the same place. Uh, not to change at all, he went for his residency as well as his fellowship at, in Madison as well. He joined the faculty as an assistant professor in 1974 and rose through the rank until he became a professor in 1984. He led the allergy division for more than 20 years and the Department of Medicine as our chair from 2005 to 2009. Dr. Bussey is truly an international authority in asthma uh, as well as allergic diseases. He has served as a leader of all major organizations in allergy and asthma, including the Academy of Allergy and the American Board of Allergy Immunology and he also chaired the NIH uh, guidelines for asthma management. More recently, he uh, received the largest NIH award ever given to the University of Wisconsin, uh, which was $70 million for leading the Inner uh, City Asthma Consortium. Four years ago, our Department of Medicine and the respective division established the William Bussey Visiting Professor of Medicine to honor Dr. Bussey's many, many contribution to our institution. Today, it's my real honor and privilege to introduce one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Weller, as the 2017 William Bussey Visiting Professor of Medicine. Dr. Weller went to Harvard for his undergrad and medical school, graduating magna cum laude. Before going to Brigham for medical residency, infectious disease fellowship, and immunology fellowship. He joined the faculty at Harvard as an assistant professor in 1979, rose through the rank till 1996 where he became a professor and also leader for the division of allergy and infectious disease at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Weller is also an internationally recognized leader in allergy immunology whose work has received long-standing NIH support. Uh, he has focused his effort, his professional research effort, on understanding the basic mechanism for leukocyte uh, and leukocyte uh, biology, particularly the role of eosinophils, uh, the cell that is near and dear to our hearts, particularly to Bill, Bill Bussey's heart, for those of you who know Bill and his research, but also to many of us here who were uh, fortunate to receive a program project grant in, uh, to study eosinophils. It also so happened uh, that uh, uh, this week we have our program project uh, uh, grant uh, uh, external review committee and also want to recognize Dr. Hirohito Kita, who's also in the audience from the Mayo Clinic, along with Dr. Peter Willer, who are, uh, is, uh, both of them are our external reviewers, and Dr. Jim Walter, who is the chair of pathology at Texas Southwestern, who's also one of our investigators on that eSinophil program project grant. Uh, Peter's work has been seminal, uh, remarkable, and highly recognized. Uh, he has focused on the very basic understanding of eosinophils, the intracellular uh, 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 steps leading to activation of mediators that are very important for inflammation and the role of eosinophil in host defense, particularly against uh, parasitic infection. Um, his, his recognition as an eosinophil superstar is only marked by him being the current president of the International uh, Eosinophil Society. Dr. Weller, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here and uh, introduce you as our visiting professor of medicine. Thank you very much for coming. It is my pleasure to uh, present uh, Dr. Weller with a, a plaque commemorating this uh, lectureship. We could please set it aside here. If, if, okay, it's going to take a picture afterward. So this is uh, presented to Professor Peter Weller, uh, William Bussey, visiting professor of medicine, the University of Wisconsin, April 7, 2017. And not, 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 to, not to forget the, the very fantastic title, the eosinophil, long a foot but not a feet. <laughs> Welcome. Very good. 
it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I thank Nazar for the very kind introduction. It's also my pleasure to um, be the uh, fourth, I think, Bussy visiting professor. My disclosures are here, consultant uh, in past for, with GlaxoSmithKline, especially with regard to uh, mepolizumab, the anti IL-5 monoclonal antibody that has efficacy with the hyperacinophilic syndrome and it will be reported shortly in what used to be called the Churg Strauss syndrome, eosinophilic granulomatosis, and polyangiitis. The other disclosure I'd have is that I'm an FOB. I'm a friend of Bill. I have traveled with Bill because of our common interests in eosinophils, eosinophilic associated diseases, for many years. And I think that the university here should be especially grateful for all that Bill has done uh, to this institution and as Nazar in, in, you know, shared with us at the beginning, all that he has done nationally and even internationally in advancing our understanding and our therapeutics for asthma and related uh, pulmonary and other eosinophil associated diseases. So Bill, I very much uh, am pleased to have this honor of presenting a lectureship in, um, in your name. So what I'd like to do is go through with you some of the evolution in our understanding of eosinophils. This is clinical grand round so that we will touch on some areas that are clinically pertinent, get into other areas that are beginning to help us understand some of the fundamentals uh, biology of eosinophils and where eosinophils fit into the immune system and what are really innate immune cells. So the eosinophil early on was like the neutrophil felt to be solely an end stage cell produced in the marrow, terminally differentiated. The early thinking was these two cell types lacked the, uh, the capacity for protein synthesis, which is not true. It was felt to be a granulocyte, which is true, and it was felt that clearly by dumping the entire contents of the granule, that's how um, the eosinophil functioned. Those granules are notable because they contain uh, several cationic proteins, as mentioned here, major basic protein, eosinophil cationic protein, and eosinophil peroxidase. Some of our understanding of the eosinophil actually arose in the 1970s when uh, Paul Beeson and his colleagues working at Oxford began to show that there was a thymic dependence of eosinophilia. And subsequent work then has really helped um, lead to an understanding that the eosinophilia mediated by this is a response of the adaptive immune system, that response of Th2 helper lymphocytes producing the cytokine interleukin-5. So the eosinophils are characteristic, quote, eosin living cells. That's, how that's the name, the lover of eosin. They constitute, as we all know, 1 to 4 percent of peripheral blood in normal donors. And they're recognized predominantly in tissues associated with mucosal surfaces, including the GI tract, and that is in health. They have been implicated over the years in uh, immune responses to helminthic parasites and in the immunopathogenesis of allergic diseases, especially asthma. And both of these responses were felt to be an, attributable to Th2 uh, lymphocyte adaptive immunity. So if we start with a clinical consideration, my simple differential diagnosis of eosinophilia is worms, wheezes, and weird diseases. So we'll start with the worms. The protozoan parasites are not worms, they're unicellular organisms. The diseases caused by the protozoa do not elicit an augmented eosinophilia. Rather, it's the helmets, the true worms, the multicellular organisms that commonly elicit um, eosinophilia. There are a diversity of these, literally A to Z. But the one that I think that I would remind you that we really have to be aware of is strongyloides stercoralis, causes the disease strongyloidiasis. Why? On the one hand, it can elicit varying degrees of eosinophilia, sometimes marginal, sometimes fluctuating. But the other major reason for paying attention to this parasite and helping to exclude it in treating a patient is that if the patient with, un, with latent or undiagnosed strongyloides is given corticosteroids, one can develop disseminated disease. So shown here is the life cycle of, of um, uh, strongyloides. Infections start when the larvae enter the skin. So this can occur often with fecally contaminated soil. It could be seen in 
uh, immigrants who are coming from areas of the world where sanitation is not great, others who have had soil exposure. What is unique about this helmet, unlike all others, is that it has this auto-infection cycle. That mean, allows larvae, instead of being passing out in the fecal stream, to internally reinfect. And that then allows the infection to literally persist for decades. So this can be encountered, say, in former um, uh, uh, veterans, of, of uh, military veterans who have served in various locales where they may have been, been exposed to fecally contaminated soil. The other issue with this auto-infection cycle is it becomes unbridled if we give the patient corticosteroids or if they develop this retroviral infection. As a consequence of that unbridling, large numbers of larvae then begin to go through this complex life cycle, and the larvae often take with them enteric gram-negative bacteria. So the manifestations of uh, strongyldendiasis are listed here. One, clearly, one can begin to think about it if the patient has eosinophilia, and it can be a fluctuating eosinophilia. At times, it can be quite prominent. An appropriate geographic history is germane. And then in uncomplicated disease, there can be a variety of manifestations as listed here. My colleagues in allergy are now, as part of a workup for urticaria and patient with eosinophilia, are finding a number of individuals with latent strongyloides, treat the strongyloides, the urticaria goes away. What we have to be really worried about is disseminated disease. And here are the manifestations that can develop with large numbers of larvae and often complicating enteric gram-negative bacteremia. So this is what we want to prevent in making a diagnosis and excluding latent strongyloides. And as I've outlined here, fecal exams are not sensitive. There is an ELISA antibody serology that I've started using almost routinely in patients who might be harboring strongyloides treating them as appropriate if the serology is positive with ivermectin. So the role of the eosinophil in response to um, parasites, and this goes back to uh, the late Charles Janeway's immunobiology text in 2008, so you know, less than a decade ago, and it was felt that uh, eosinophils evolved to kill antibody-coated parasites. And indeed, if one studies this in vitro, as was done, one can see here's a schistosomula, stage of uh, disease, uh, the parasite that causes schistosomiasis, and adherent to this schistosomula in gang tackle are a large numbers of eosinophils. And the eosinophils can mediate binding to the parasite, their target by complement or antibody mediated mechanisms. They, quote, degranulate on the surface of the parasite. And some of the cationic proteins that I mentioned earlier that are in the granules are very effective in the test tube in killing the parasite. What about in vivo? Well, in humans, it's, it's harder to sort out, though one might comment probably the commonest cause of eosinophilia globally is intestinal helminth infections. And eosinophils clearly are not totally effective in eradicating those or they wouldn't be persisting. Um, what about in mice? Well, as mice, m mouse models developed, it seemed to be easy. We can answer the question. We can in infect mice that in have increased numbers of eosinophils, so they're IL-5 transgenic mice, overproducing IL-5 that drives the eosinophilia. Or conversely, we can infect mice that don't have eosinophils, that have had their eosinophils either depleted by antibody or by genetic mechanisms. And as I show here, this is a study of the parasite that causes cystosomiasis given to two different strains of genetically uh, eosinophil-depleted mice. And the bottom line conclusion is, as I've summarized here, overall our data indicate that eosinophil ablation has no impact on traditional measures of disease in the S. Mansoni infection model um, in, v in mice. There are many other studies now, um, again mostly in mice, that fail to re reveal a role for eosinophils as, quote, helminth and toxic cells. So our understanding of the eosinophil as a cell that somehow uniquely evolved to kill parasites 
has to be tempered. The hypothesis is not yet proven. Moreover, helminths have evolved with their mammalian hosts over a period of time. And as illustrated here, for trichinella larvae that have co-evolved with the host, the survival of the trichinella larvae actually depends on eosinophils. So rather than killing the larvae, as they insist in muscle, the eosinophil helps the larvae survive. And this is mediated by an eosinophil-derived cytokine, interleukin-10. Sorry. So we now are being introduced to the fact that eosinophils may be sources of cytokines that may have biological relevance here, interleukin-10. So if we come back to the eosinophil, as shown here in this cover of uh, a primer from JAMA, actually a cell of a patient that I took care of, one can see the hallmark ultrastructural features of eosinophils. There are specific granules containing a unique core. Those granules, as we mentioned, containing some of their uh, very specific cationic proteins. And then there's also an increasing recognition over a period of time that eosinophils contain multiple cytokines and many of these are preformed and stored. So listed here are indeed some of the cytokines, and just some of them, there are more, that are recognized as coming from eosinophils, both human and mouse eosinophils. And as one can see, there's quite a panoply of biological actions that could be mediated by these different types of cytokines. So this begins to introduce us to the idea that number one, Eosinophils are very distinct cells of the innate immune system. They are not necessarily um, dependent on adaptive immunity to begin to arm them with the capacity to release different kinds of cytokines. The other issue that we are in being introduced to that I'll come back to is eosinophil-derived cytokines. Many of them are present preformed as proteins within eosinophils. This very much differentiates the eosinophil from some of the more common lymphocyte populations that have to be transcriptionally activated, have to start synthesizing new protein before they can release the signature cytokines associated with those lymphocytes. Not this cell. It shows up, it's got within its granules this panoply of cytokine proteins. And then finally, parsimony would suggest that the eosinophil secretion of the various cytokines has to be mediated by some selective mechanism. It makes no sense, so this bombs away approach that would release dozens of cytokines uniformly and simultaneously. This is data from my colleague, Lisa Spencer, and this is part of the evidence that indeed human eosinophils contain preformed cytokines. And with cells from, isolated from six different normal donors, assaying for seven different kinds of cytokines, one can see that for all seven cytokines, there are preformed uh, stores of these cytokines within eosinophils. Where are these cytokines stored? In addition to studying lysates, as was done here, one can do what's called subcellular fractionation. Break the cell open, put it on a, on a density gradient, centrifuge it, dense granules will separate from the other fractions of the cell. And the results are shown here. So on the left here is eosinophil peroxidase, a marker of the granules, and one sees for each of these seven cytokines, the dominant preforms pool of, of cytokine proteins is resident within the, the granules. So again, as a cell of the innate immune system, it is showing up with this preformed content of varied cytokines with varying biological activities. These can be differentially released by mechanisms that we don't fully understand. And this is some representative data where cells were stimulated with TNF-alpha, various cytokines are being assayed. And here IL-4 is coming out of the cells from three different donors, interferon gamma also largely being released. Whereas if we stimulate the cells with a different stimulus, now IL-12, one begins to see a different pattern. IL-4 not as prominent. IL-13, again with three different donors, behaving all the same, 
now becoming a more major cytokine secreted by the eosinophils along with interferon gamma. So there are mechanisms for differential release and what are the mechanisms by which eosinophils, quote, degranulate. The former process that had been envisioned in parasite immunity to, parasi to, to helminths, and probably as we illustrated in that early picture of the, of the poor schistosomula being gang tackled, was exocytosis. The entire granule goes to the surface, to the plasma membrane, fuses, dumps its whole contents out uh, in toto. This probably it does not occur except on the surfaces of uh, parasitic targets. So there are two other processes that we will consider. One is something that's called piecemeal degranulation, which is a process that allows the selective mobilization of granular contents into vesicles for secretion. And this is schematized here, so that if we have granules with their cytokines, or it could be even their major basic protein or their cationic proteins, these can be loaded into vesicles that transit to the surface and release, in this case, the two red cytokines. So this is an illustration of some of the structural basis for piecemeal degranulation. On the left, we see a normally eosinophil, unstimulated. Here are the characteristic granules with their crystalloid cores. Here are uh, eosinophils from the same donor, stimulated with a chemokine, eotaxin, saying eotaxin 1. And if the red arrows direct our attention. We're now looking at granules, which are intracellular. They're not fusing with the plasma membrane. But one can begin to see evidence that the contents of the granules are being mobilized because they're no longer in the granule and are probably being secreted. Further, if we look at the granules as they begin to empty some of their contents, one can see that within the granule is a very complex network of vesicles that are, have uh, evolved to help mediate the secretory process. And some of these vesicular compartments actually bud off from the granule and are involved in transport. So if we come back to the, the cartoon, what is happening is these secretory vesicles, which are represented here, they have a curious geometry. We've called them eosinophil sombrero vesicles. They look like a Mexican hat cut in cross section. These are actually tubular structures. So they mediate the transport of cytokines and granular proteins that are being released by this piecemeal degranulation process. So piecemeal degranulation gives us isolated secreted proteins with some selectivity. And this is evident in a number of, pop, of publications. And I'm not going to go through the details, stuff that we've performed in terms of understanding some of the secretory processes. Then companion studies, notably one from this institution early in, in, in 2007, and a follow-up study from our group in 2009 showing that eosinophils can indeed, human eosinophils can indeed release both Th1, Th2, and other cytokines. So another process of, quote, degranulation that we'll consider is a recognition that eosinophils can re release, when they die, when they undergo cytolysis, they can release membrane-bound granules. This has been De demonstrated for many years to occur in vivo. So on the left here are EM studies looking at the granules free in the skin. Here are some others at the light level, again seeing cell-free eosinophil granules, these red staining dots. And as I noted, this has been well recognized for um, many years. And this is a representative study which actually indicates that allergen-induced eosinophil cytolysis is the primary mechanism for granular release. In this study, they identified cells that were undergoing piecemeal degranulation. So here, the granules are inside the cell but emptying. And then there are free granules here, which these authors termed eos due to eosinophil cytolysis, and also found clusters of these free granules. So this is a process that is well recognized uh, to occur in vivo. Why are we interested in that? We came back a couple of years ago and in concert with some colleagues, such as Redwan Mockbell, asked the heretical question, 
could these intracellular organelles function extracellularly? And indeed they can. When one isolates them, they have receptors on their surface, including receptor, for instance, interferon gamma. When they bind their ligand on the surface, there's signal transduction pathways within the granule that will then lead to differential secretion of granule contents. So these are two of the papers that report on what I just mentioned, that eosinophil granules function extracellularly as receptive-mediated secretory organelles. And some of the receptors that they express include receptors not only for uh, cytokines such as interleukin gamma, but also for lipids, the cysteine leukotrienes. If one asks the question, can granules themselves differentially release cytokines? And the answer is yes. Here are isolated granules being stimulated with increasing concentrations of interferon gamma. And we're, in this experiment, we're assaying three cytokines. One sees a demonstrable release of IL-4, not IL-13, but, we, but increased response release of IL-6. This is from the ice-free granules. And this tends to parallel the pattern of secretion that the same stimulus, interferon gamma, would elicit from intact eosinophils. So to recapitulate, mechanisms of eosinophil granulation did involve this process of piecemeal degranulation, and also potentially can involve the capacity of cell-free eosinophil granules released by cytolysis to function as uh, secretion-competent organelles extracellularly. Now we're going to turn for, to some studies that are, you know, revealing from what is called cytokine reporter mice. The cytokine reporter mice have been developed so that when a cell in a mouse is it, uh, activated to start synthesizing a specific cytokine, that will be linked to the capacity of the cell to develop a fluorescent protein, such as green fluorescent protein. And one of the first cytokine reporter mice that were generated, something under called the forget mice, they are GFP IL-4 mice. And they identify eosinophils as well as other cells as sources of IL-4. There's also, using the same strategy, a recognition that another cytokine of pertinence to eosinophil, IL-5, that drives eosinophil production, is also being produced by not just TH2 cells, but this, this helps to identify a new population of cells, the innate immune cells, the ILC2 cells, that really are innate analogs of TH2 lymphocytes in that ILC2 cells are sources of interleukin-5. So if we come back and look at some of the, the findings from the GFP IL-4 reporter mice. One surprising finding early on was that we could now begin to identify eosinophils in tissues that we really hadn't recognized in the past. So here's an eosinophil in adipose tissue. In all of the major texts on where eosinophils are found, nobody mentions adipose tissue. There's the lungs, there's the GI tract, etc., mucosal surfaces, but not the the uh, adipose tissue. And using these GFP IL-4 uh, reporter mice, one could assay the percentage of cells in the adipose tissue, which were eosinophils, and expressing IL-4. And as shown on the right here, almost 90% of the IL-4 GFP positive cells were eosinophils. So what is the import of that? And this has led to a recognition that eosinophils have roles in affecting glucose metabolism. So eosinophils are the major IL-4 expressing cells in white adipose tissues in mice. And in their absence, AAMC's alternatively active macrophages are greatly attenuated. Importantly, mice fed on a high fat diet developed increased body fat, impaired glucose tolerance, and insulin resistance if they didn't have the eosinophils <coughs> present. So here is a recognition of an activity mediated by an eosinophil cytokine, IL-4, acting in a tissue that we really hadn't paid attention to before, at least as eosinophil-focused individuals. 
and having an impact on uh, gl glucose metabolism. It's also, I think, illustrative if one goes back to this to the eosinophil deficient mice. Nobody recognized when these mice were housed in an standard animal care facilities, given standard diet, that there was a, a phenotype associated with it. So until these mice were essentially challenged by putting them on a high-fat diet, diet, one didn't recognize that there was an impairment. Eosinophil IL-4, uh, eosinophil-derived IL-4, has also been implicated in a number of tissue repair processes, and I illustrate one of them here, where eosinophil secreting IL-4 will facilitate experimental regeneration of the liver, again, in mice. There are other activities uh, that were heretofore unappreciated. This is now looking not at IL-4, but at two other eosinophil-derived cytokines, which are important for the maintenance of plasma cells in the bone marrow. And those two secreted uh, uh, proteins, one is interleukin-6, the other is something that's called APRIL, uh, which is a proliferation-inducing ligand. And then finally, again, we were revealing activities of eosinophils based on their capacity to release their cytokines. So eosinophils orchestrate cancer rejection in this experiment by normalizing tumor, va tumor vessels and enhancing infiltration of CD8 positive T cells. And they're doing that by secreting chemoattractants that, call it, that guide and attract the T cells in. So if in this cartoon that's prepared by my colleague Lisa Spencer begins to try to capture. Eosinophils have, by dint of their capacity to release not only their granule proteins, but specifically all of these varied cytokines, and all of these are established to be coming from within eosinophils. These cytokines, when they're released, can affect aspects of immunity, cellular and humoral, but specifically also tissue repair, metabolism, as we just illustrated, elements of development. So eosinophils are important for early mammary gland development, as well as the interactions with other cells. So we then are faced, if we come back to our, you know, a clinical focus. I mean, we mentioned at the beginning worms, wheezes, and weird diseases. Wheezes would include asthma, clearly. And some of the weird diseases include some of the eosinophilic syndromes, EGPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, what used to be called Church strauss vasculitis, would be one of these, quote, weird diseases, some of the hyper-eosinophilic syndromes. So we would then say, okay, how do we treat these? And I think we often turn to corticosteroids as our mainstay of therapy in asthma and some of these other processes. Is there a role for um, contemporary therapeutics, specifically therapeutics that would neutralize one of the signal cytokines that is responsible for eosinophil development, and that is interleukin-5. What does interleukin-5 do and where does it come from? Well, the major sources we've already alluded to, the Th2 CD4 positive T cells, would be a major source of IL-5. The other cell that we've already alluded to also are these ILC2 innate immune lymphocyte populations. There are other cells that potentially can contribute minor amounts of, of IL-5, um, eosinophils themselves, basophils, epithelial cells, and then at times CD8 positive T cells. What does IL-5 do? Um, it has several activities. It is not required for the er most early development of an, this early uh, eosinophil progenitor. But it is involved in promoting the maturation of the progenitor into a more mature cell. So that's one of the activities. Another is it acts to release mature eosinophils that are stored within the bone marrow. So within our bone marrow, there, once eosinophils are produced, there is a pool of mature cells ready to be mobilized, and it is interleukin-5 that will release these and allow them to circulate 
into the blood. Importantly, IL-5 also sustains the viability of mature eosinophils and augments their eosinophil functions. So as we begin to think clinically of those eosinophilic diseases, the weird, the weird diseases, I mean the wheezes, the asthma involving the lungs, or some of the varied eosinophilic diseases that can involve different aspects of the GI tract, it's appropriate, as has been done, to question um, whether neutralizing IL-5 with newer therapeutics may be beneficial therapeutically and may have an effect in sort of sparing patients from needing corticosteroids. So there are two anti-IL-5 therapeutics that are currently FDA approved, at least for eosinophilic phenotype asthma, mepolizumab and resolizumab. And both of these act by binding to IL-5 itself. So by binding to IL-5, it neutralizes the activity of IL-5. So those are two agents that are available currently for the FDA-approved indications. <clears throat> for mepolizumab, at least, there is efficacy data published with some of the, quote, weird diseases that um, neutralizing IL-5 may be effective. This is true in the hyperosinophilic syndrome, a study that we contributed to uh, a couple of years ago in the New England Journal. And then there's more recent data with regard to this EGPA, uh, Churg-Strauss syndrome type of vasculitis, that administering mepolizumab to those subjects also can be effective in reducing clinical uh, exacerbations. In the Churg-Strauss syndrome, those exacerbations are often flares of asthma, sinus disease, so the sinopulmonary flares, and also al allowing those patients to taper or, at times, even get off their corticosteroids. So these are two promising therapeutics um, that clearly are being uh, in clinical practice now for forms of asthma and may have broader indications for some of the other eosinophilic diseases. There's a third uh, uh, monoclonal antibody, Benralizumab, which has a different mechanism of action. Again, it aims to neutralize IL-5, but it does it by not by binding to IL-5, but by binding to the IL-5 receptor. So if it binds to the IL-5 receptor, number one, IL-5 can't come in and bind to its receptor. So if IL-5 is present, it, it, it's essentially functionally neutralized. IL-5 is still present, but it just cannot activate its, its required receptor. The other property of this antibody, though, is when it binds to the IL-5 receptor, it can in, in, it initiate uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So in one hand, it promises actually maybe to even be more effective in helping to destroy the offending eosinophil. This is a pro this is destruction process is not inflammatory. It's anti-inflammatory, so we don't have to worry about the consequences of that. But one of the things I would close with is do we have to worry about other consequences? As we talked about the roles of eosinophils in innate immunity and the diverse numbers of cytokines that they can release that govern different processes, do we risk destroying those eosinophils that probably have beneficial effects in, in normal homeostasis with this approach? Do we want to you know, put those cells at risk or other cells that might be expressing the IL-5 IL receptor alpha? Right now, there's some clinical practice with um, ben benralizumab, which would indicate that it, it's safe and effective. But I think that as I close the grand rounds, as clinicians, I think we have to be cognizant that, at least hypothetically, there may be potential side effects to this kind of a strategy, which puts cells that express the IL-5 receptor at risk of being destroyed. And just as those you know, eosinophil-deficient mice uh, that were um, uh, where IL-4 coming out of the eosinophil was activating alternative active macrophages and affecting glucose metabolism, those mice seemed fine. 
until they were given high-fat diet. Do we have to start paying attention to Americans with high-fat diets to find out that they, too, are suffering untoward consequences of Benralizumab? I don't know. But I think collectively it's going to be, you know, default to us as clinicians to be cognizant of potential side, subtle side effects that if they were to develop, and it's not by no means certain that they will. It's a hypothetical concern. So, you know, I will close with that hypothetical concern and again, you know, reiterate that I think our understanding of eosinophil has come a long way. The understanding how it degranulates is important, but also a recognition as schematized here of the diversity of cytokines that this cell of the innate immune system is capable of releasing and of the panoply of different host responses that can be mediated by eosinophils. There are no humans with bona fide absences of eosinophils uh, that have been reported in a contemporary literature where one could really ascertain an absence of eosinophils, which would suggest that eosinophils have critical functions in health. So I will close with that and gratefully acknowledge a number of folks that have worked along with us over the years in our studies of eosinophil biology. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Weir, for an outstanding presentation. Um, we now can take questions. Um, uh, Peter, if I can ask you to call on the, on the audience and then repeat their question for the recording. Very good. Please. The question is, the granules that are reported to function uh, independently, do they have within them capacity for protein synthesis or nucleic acids? And you know the definitive answers aren't in for either of those. There are reports, though, that uh, the RNA species are present, and the evidence has been accumulated over the years. Some of it's autoradiography, looking at uridine uh, being localized to granules. Um, so there are reports that there, there are RNA and ribosomal-like structures potentially within granules. The issue of protein synthesis is a significant one. It really has not been studied. I think one of the open questions, at least in our, for our investigations are, is do these granules have a capacity to be restocked? Once they've secreted some of their cytokines, can they get reloaded with either the same cytokine or other cytokines? And you know, might that occur within the granule? We don't know. Might it lead to you know, synthesis occurring outside the granule but within the cell and then you know, targeting it for um, the granule? It's a good, excellent question. Thank you. Other questions? Bill. So the questions that uh, Dr. Bassi asks are, are major questions. One is, how does a poor eosinophil get instructed to do what it, it does? Um, and then um, in the setting of inflammation, you know, how is it contributing to inflammation or potentially Im immune modulation? And I think in all honesty, we don't understand that now, do we? Um, we know from work from the lab here as, as well as our own lab that with specific stimuli there can be selective release of, of panels of cytokines and they're not intuitively obvious. So you stimulate with a TH2 agonist, you don't get TH2 cytokines out. You get TH1, you get immunomodulatory. My guess would be that you know, we have much more to learn in terms of the milieu in which an eosinophil resides and that it probably receives a multitude 
of signals coming in from the extracellular matrix, from lipid mediators, from other cytokines, from cell-cell interactions, and that somehow in a combinatorial process, that begins to dictate what is being secreted from an eosinophil. Um, with regard to, you know, when it gets involved in an inflammatory response, there are clearly mechanisms that, it, and the, on the one hand, lead to the recruitment of larger numbers of eosinophils, whether it be into the airway or the tissues and asthma. Something is leading to a greater number of, of eosinophils. That's different from eos in the adipose tissue. We don't have, you know, an eosinophil associated adipocyteitis or, or, you know, um, so I think that's part of it is, is, you know, for some of the diseases, there's augmented recruitment. Part of that recruitment probably is augmented activation as well, um, and which is contributing to the release. Not only we focused on, on cytokine proteins, but as you know, eosinophils are rich sources of lipid mediators, leukotriene C4 being, you know, a major uh, contributor in asthma. Might the cell also have immunomodulatory roles? Um, that's actually suggested as well in, some, in that study uh, that I showed where the eosinophil ablated mice were infected with a parasite that causes schistosomiasis. The senior author there, Helene Rosenberg, in a sentence I did not highlight, says after concluding that it, no, there were no, no effects on, on the parasite, she said maybe eos are doing something that's immunomodulatory. So I think in the whole, we have a lot more to learn. There are advances. I might turn this around, though, and ask you a question. You've been involved with this last monoclonal antibody, benralizumab, that I talked about. Do you have concerns about its potential, you know, side effects? that I mean, Bill was saying early on, there were some concerns. There were a couple of individuals with sort of wet fever and maybe other, other symptoms. Um, but that indeed, you know, as you know, I raised at the end, we have to be aware of these as potential, you know, providing us insights into, you know, the biology of the cell and, and so on. I would say evolution, I don't know why they're in the fat, but I think they, they clearly evolved to be, you know, in, in be localized in the fat. And at this point, no one's really studied eosinophil trafficking. What is it that, you know, leads to a quantitatively minor population, but maybe functionally important or critical population to be resident in the fat? Um, I think also, you know, it, it, you know, these studies bring to mind that our conventional way of assessing cells present it has been very limited. Conventional H&E doesn't do a good job. Sometimes the E is eosin, but it doesn't always do a good job, especially if you're looking at a 5 or 10 micron section. You cut through fat, you could easily miss that eosinophil that was illustrated in the science article. Um, so that I, it wouldn't surprise me that we're going to find eosinophils in many more you know, organs and tissues than had been appreciated. The same thing is true with mammary gland development early on, um, that eosinophils have a role there. And then complicating a lot of these things is, you know, this tremendous redundancy in other cells being able to contribute um, to, you know, some of these processes so that you know, one may see a decrement in function associated with, say, lesser activity by the eosinophil. Some of that will be uh, uh, taken up by, by other cells, so. Okay. Okay, Kelly. So the question comes back to, you know, are there humans 
uh, that, ha that lack eosinophils. And we actually published a paper, several of us, looking at the handful of individuals that have been reported to nominate lack eosinophils. None of those have been reported in the last 25 years. And if you go back and you, and you critically look at those early studies, it's not clear that eosinophils were really lacking. We already know that an eosinophil number in the blood is 1 to 4 percent. If it's you know a bell-shaped curve, somebody's going to be beneath the level of detection. And that's before you introduce any eosinopenic effect of steroids, endogenous or otherwise, or stress or so on. Um, those early reports lacked any capacity to look for some of the eosinophil granule proteins, which would be during or now. Um, so that, you know, I think looking back and then taking the more recent history where people are more attentive, to, uh, there's really no documented individual that lacks eosinophils. So I've often argued in my own mind that that tells us something about the centrality of eosinophils to health. And it's part of the reasons that, you know, we've not just focused on EOs in terms of parasite killing or EOs and asthma, that there, there has to be some reason, and at least in my mind, that an eosinophil has evolved. And specifically, you know, why should it be putting this much energy into making all of these cytokines? So not to our knowledge are there eosinophil deficient individuals. So the question is, can, can you go back in evolution and look at what we started essentially when the eosinophils began to evolve? Um, you can do it, you, as yet it hasn't been done with sort of uh, nucleic acid an analyses. One of the problems one gets into is what is an eosinophil? I mean, literally, it's an eosin-loving cell, so that if one, rele one relies only on staining properties of cells, as one begins to get back, one can certainly find eosinophil granulocytes in essentially all vertebrates. Prior to vertebrates, because of this, the varying staining capacities of cells, it becomes problematic. Are they early eosinophils or not? Um, so, an interesting question for which you know we don't have early early answers as yet in terms of how far. But certainly, in in evolution, uh, every vertebrate is known to have an eosinophil. Please. I think that that's an interesting question. It's getting at you know why, what's the underlying biology that by, whereby these granules can actually continue to function extracellularly, and there's still a, a large number of questions there that we don't know. Um, we don't know, for instance, how long can they function? What is their energy source? I mean, is there something in the granule that they'll burn up after they've done their initial secretion? Um, as we thought about it, I mean, one of the early findings was asking the question, on the surface of the granule, how are the receptors oriented? Because when they're inside the cell, it's the nominal extracellular domain that is in the cell. It's in the cytoplasm. So when the ground gets released, yeah, it can start reacting, responding to something that's, quote, extracellular because it, the receptor is oriented. What does that tell us about the, the granule inside the cell? And what I would begin to suggest is that those receptors that are oriented in quote, including with their, quote, extracellular domain, but still inside the cell, are actually receiving signals inside the cell that help, help regulate their function. Why do I say that? Well, one of the receptors, some of the receptors we showed were receptors for the leukotrienes, the cystinia leukotrienes. We have other evidence, though, that the levels of intracellular leukotriene C4 help govern the release from human eosinophils of the preformed IL-4. So I think some of the receptors on the granule probably are actually functioning in the granule as the granule still is within an eosinophil. Uh, 
because this question is asking co or my comments on shifting away from a reliance on corticosteroids for the treatment of a variety of eosinophil association diseases to say the NDL5 therapeutics that are you know, probably much more targeted in terms of helping to regulate eosinophil recruitment and function. I think the clinical experience would indicate that at least for an, a good number of individuals, that is not only a rational therapy, but it's a beneficial therapy that um, I know from the study that we've just completed with, the, again, the Churg strauss variant and EGPA, um, this was a randomized double-blind trial, multi-center international trial. Um, it'll be coming out shortly in the New England Journal. Talking to those subjects who were receiving mepolizumab versus control, they knew. Many of them knew what they were getting. Uh, not all of them. Some guessed wrong. But th they're, they're so grateful to be down, down, had their corticosteroids tapered or even terminated that they were, you know, really a pr very appreciative of uh, mepolizumab. So, you know, the benefits are, uh, for them, very substantial in, in terms of their well-being, even in the short term, let alone the long-term complications that of corticosteroids that we're all so familiar with. Other questions? I have a quick question for you, Peter, about the eosinophil and fibrosis. We see it a lot next to fibrotic diseases. Would you like to comment on that? So the question relates to eosinophils and, and fibrotic diseases. And um, I think that this is an area that, that continues to warrant investigation. Um, one of the early, some of the early cytokines that we identified coming out of eosinophils were indeed the TGF alpha, alpha, and beta. Um, so that there is that um, opportunity. I alluded to in one of my slides to, e to eosinophil IL-4 being involved in liver regeneration. There are other studies in terms of enhanced wound healing and so on that, and, and tissue repair that are mediated by eosinophils in a beneficial sense. I think likely, likely while some may benefit, an overactivity of an eosinophil helping become, you know, drive the development of fibrosis would be deleterious. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you.